So is the word model actually any more helpful or is this just another example of unintuitive terminology? Certainly the word is very widely used in everyday life to uh, represent a whole range of different things. And it's not immediately clear what, say, a model plane or model train or a model portfolio or a catwalk supermodel or a climate model or a cosmological model or an economic or socio-political model have in common with each other. But all, in some way, attempt to capture or represent some aspects of a system whilst at the same time almost always glossing over others. So, for example, the Airfix Spitfire might uh, accurately capture the external dimensions at 1 48th scale, but it lacks all of the internal engineering and, crucially, it can't fly. A uh, catwalk supermodel might represent the ideal frame for showing off haute couture, but at the same time might give potential customers a slightly misleading impression of what they themselves might look like in those clothes. The great statistician George Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. This is a widely quoted and important caveat, but it shouldn't be taken just as an admission of failure. Very often, models are useful not just in spite of the ways that they are wrong, but because of those, that wrongness. The omissions and simplifications that make the model possible. Something that reproduces uh, the real system in every last detail isn't really a model at all, it's basically the thing itself, like the one-to-one -one scale maps satirised by Lewis Carroll and Borges. In the context of machine learning, but also throughout science and beyond, we want a model to tell us something about a system of interest, that is to say, give us some output, when we give it some information about the state of that system, that is to say, give it some input. In other words, it's just a function, which we might represent like this. Given some potentially multi-valued input x, which uh, might consist of individual values x1, x2, x3, up to xd, which we variously refer to as independent variables or explanatory variables or predictors or observations, samples, measurements or features, Given that, we would like to predict, again, a potentially multi-valued output, y, which might consist of individual values, y1, y2, y3, and so on. And those values are known as the dependent variable, or the prediction, or the inference, or the label. Collectively, these x's and y's are known as the model variables. So these variables could be anything. For the moment, let's just forget about the types of data they may contain. If there's one thing we know from living in the age of information, it's that literally anything can be represented as numbers. Uh, later on, we will of course get much more specific about particular kinds of data, because there's a, a, a great deal of variation in the applicability of different techniques to Types, but for the moment, let's keep things completely general. What we have come up with then is an extremely abstract, seemingly trivial model of a model. And it's general enough to encompass a wide range of classic examples from physics, biology, economics, engineering, and so on. This might include models of uh, action potentials in the brain, models of gravitation, models of voltage, or uh, the time value of money. Some of these models are simple enough and elegant enough and reliable enough that we get a bit full of ourselves and call them laws. Physics, in particular, is 
especially good at finding problem spaces, the spaces of the very, very large or the very small, uh, where the model approximations are very, very good. However, these remain models, and as such, as George Box would tell us, they are still wrong, at least in the sense of uh, usefully glossing over and admitting the relevant details in order to get at the truth underlying the system. Consider Newton's model of gravitation. The force between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. This is a functional form describing a relationship between variables, but to get actual numbers out, it needs to be parameterized, in this case with the universal gravitational constant g. This value g grounds the model, turning it from an abstract notion of how the entities interact into something quantitative which can make concrete predictions. This parameter or constant g isn't just plucked out of thin air, but it's fitted from data. It's given the value that makes the model most closely agree with observable reality. And this is true for parameters in general. Let's update our general model of a model to include some parameters, which will typically denote with the Greek letter theta. And again, theta is multi-valued. Uh, there could be many individual parameters that need to go into the model, which will be called theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and so on. For some specific classes of model, we will use different notation, in particular for linear models, which we'll talk a lot about next week. We generally use the letter W for weights to represent the parameters instead, but the general structure is the same. Traditionally, in science and beyond, parameters have been viewed with suspicion. They are a necessary evil in order to make models work, but they're also uh, a source of error. Um, the more parameters you have, the more measurements that you have to make in order to fit them, and so there's the more uh, opportunities for getting things wrong. Moreover, having lots of parameters can make a model excessively flexible. Uh, John von Neumann famously said, with four parameters I can fit an elephant, and with five I can make him wiggle his trunk. What he was implying by this is that having lots of parameters in your model is in some sense cheating, because it makes the model too flexible. It makes it possible to fit the data better without having any greater explanatory power or being closer to reality. As a general principle, if you have uh, as many parameters in your model or more than you have observations, it is always possible to construct a model that will fit the data perfectly, but it probably won't be a very good model. This is known as overfitting, and we will be encountering it an awful lot uh, in this week's lectures and in the weeks to come. Consider, again, Isaac Newton's model of gravitation. Where does a model like this come from? Well, clearly it will be informed by observations and measurements, perhaps many, many of them taken over years, centuries, even millennia. But then it requires a lot of careful thinking and hard contemplation and beard stroking until eventually insight strikes, the light dawns and everything becomes magically clear. This has been the model of scientific inquiry since antiquity. It's the classic eureka moment of Archimedes in his bathtub. And clearly it has achieved great things. It works really well under certain circumstances. In particular, when the problem being considered is low dimensional, when there are 
few enough variables to be able to hold them all in your mind at the same time. Second, when the problem actually admits of an elegant explanatory functional form. And thirdly, when you are Isaac Newton. Now, number three, who knows? Perhaps some of you will turn out to be uh, great mathematical and scientific geniuses of that calibre. That would be great, and I hope you'll use your powers for good. But one and two are very frequently not the case. Activities at the meso scale, that is to say, the scale of living things, in between the enormously large and very small. Problems of resource management and logistics, of media and politics, of social dynamics and the spread of diseases, problems involving cities full of people with emotions and opinions and desire and agency, those sorts of problems tend to be pretty messy. Behaviour is often driven by a large number of different factors, many of which may not be even measurable, and those factors might interact in complex, unfathomable ways. These sort of problems tend not to be susceptible to simple explanatory models that combine a small number of variables in an elegant and uh, insightful functional form. But if insight may not be enormous help often in those kinds of problems, and it may be a bit thin on the ground, what we do sometimes have is data, perhaps even a lot of it. Which brings us, at long last, back to the domain of machine learning. Which is really just a shift of emphasis. Traditional models in physics, physiology, economics, and so on, are explicit. The behavior is expressed directly through the functional form. In machine learning, we, to at least some extent, give up on that explicit specification, and instead attempt to outsource as much as possible of the behavior into the parameters. We say effectively, we don't really know how this works, but let's see if we can fit our way out of that hole. 